point out is that uh, privacy is very uh, uh, dependent on political will. Um, and so even as we are talking about, and you know, we've observed this in terms of you know, getting countries to ratify the, the Malabo Convention, um, lots of challenges there, despite countries coming out very clearly and stating that we are going to enact standalone um, laws and provisions. I think the third point that I want to point out, just even at the regional level, is that um, you know, we have bodies that are tasked with harmonizing um, laws and policies on, on privacy and data protection. Um, but there have been challenges, for example, um, challenges observed with the East African Communications Organization, where this organization notes that, uh, you know, even on, on issues as, as standard as um, um, spectrum conversations, that individuals and member states are not contributing to these harmonization um, uh, uh, efforts, um, which, you know, essentially all boils down to political will. Um, Political will naturally can be uh, engendered at the national level through coordinated efforts by, you know, multiple stakeholders. But it requires, um, um, you know, you know, this this collective unified voice, um, not just from civil society organisations, but also from individuals, uh, from private sector entities, from multinationals who can all come together um, um, to reiterate the importance of minimum standards of minimum privacy um, protections. Um, in the areas um, of, of surveillance, um, um, in the areas of enacting standalone data protection laws um, um, and, and, and policies and regulations. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, apologies. Uh, my network just totally went off there for a bit, uh, but uh, I was able to uh, catch your submission. Thank you very much, CJ. Uh, and based on what you have raised, I'd like to uh, come to Becca. Uh, Becca is from uh, Nita U. Um, considering what CG has just said, uh, the role of uh, civil society and uh, uh, you know governments uh, as you know a government entity uh, that you know uh, is responsible for. Uh, Basically, data protection and privacy in Uganda is in the docket of uh, uh, NITA U. Um, what roles are entities like the one uh, you, you work in uh, playing to ensure this privacy and a country like Uganda, uh, how, how do we ensure that our laws actually do conform? Thank you, Gabriel, and uh, good afternoon to you all. Thank you for this opportunity. My name is Beka Birikuja. I'm from the National IT Authority of Uganda, the regulator for data protection in Uganda. So the role that we are playing as NITA to ensure that uh, the right to data protection and privacy is complied with and um, guaranteed in various sectors. One, we started with supporting the Ministry of ICT to have a comprehensive law. Uh, the act was enacted in 2019, which gave the rights, laid them down. Then we supported them in this year in uh, development and the eventual signing of the regulations that give the procedural ways in which these rights can actually be uh, in, uh, exercised and even enforced. Uh, so beyond that, what uh, NITA does, one, we create awareness on the laws on this, specifically the Data Protection and Privacy Act within the various sectors. Then um, the other is registration. It's something that we're going to embark on. Registration, anyone who is collecting data, personal data that is, will be required to be registered. So we'll be taking them through registration. will help them uh, develop better privacy policies and notices, statements, and disclosures to enable and show people how their information can be collected. But even then, we'll also have a portal where complaints can be made to make it easier, not just beyond the pandemic that people are in a lockdown, but even uh, for those that are collecting uh, data and citizens. So the other definitely will be collaboration. As you are aware, we are in a digital or a global village. So you may find that an entity that is outside Uganda could collect information or a citizen wants to have it correct, corrected. So uh, to be able to enforce some of our decisions, we'll um, collaborate with uh, the regional, starting with continental um, uh, bodies that um, 
bring together the data protection authorities in Africa, but even also in an international state, that way we can uh, reach out to them and ensure that these decisions that we take or those that they take on behalf of our citizens can actually be enforced. So largely that's what we are doing, but then um, bring it back to uh, the report, it has highlighted aspects of um, surveillance, uh, biometric encryption and all that. Definitely these government agencies, particularly those that are involved in such activities, they have to be sensitized then trained. Um, so it will start with that and then all those that are um, found wanting or uh, violating the provisions of the law, they will be brought to book. But allow me to also use this opportunity to highlight uh, in the summary of um, the report where you noted that Uganda is lacking in having uh, provisions on uh, or a requirement to conduct uh, privacy impact assessments. I beg, um, uh, you to correct this, otherwise it's not a, a correct reflection of what's in the law, specifically under Regulation 12, the law or the regulations require anyone who will be processing personal data with processing will have a high risk to the rights and freedoms of the of the data subjects to conduct a privacy impact assessment. So that isn't a gap since it is already provided for in the law. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, even for that clarification will be taken into consideration. And uh, we are taking note of the other uh, concerns and clarifications that uh, are, we're receiving through the chat. Uh, these will uh, benefit us in uh, updating the report. Uh, so it is actually a very accurate report that uh, shows around. It was uh, 19. Uh, so, um, terrorism have led governments to, you know, uh, to, to stay apart in some cases. So, I'd like to go over to uh, Ogundipe from Nigeria to just speak about uh, safeguards. Uh, that can be put in place uh, for uh, that agencies have to, to do surveillance. Topic, did you hear me? Yes, uh, no, I didn't hear you. That was, uh, you were breaking a lot. Please, can you kindly go over that again? Sorry about that. And I uh, have even tried to switch uh, network uh, internet providers. But uh, my question is in relation to terrorism and, you know, other trends that have given governments, you know, excuses to uh, abuse uh, people's privacy rights. Uh, and what safeguards can be put in place to deal with unlawful surveillance? and uh, the agencies that abuse the powers they have to do surveillance. Um, all right, thanks. Okay, that's that was uh, much clearer. So um, the, uh, the first thing that can be observed is just that um, there is um, some sort of discrepancies in, in, in the laws and policies um, around uh, data privacy um, in Nigeria. And what I mean by that is while you have um, the interception, the, the law on interception of communications that recommends um, judicial oversight when it comes to how in, in, um, communication can be intercepted. On the other hand, you have the Cybercrime Act that allows um, law enforcement agencies to be able to demand um, all kinds of data, even intercept communication without a court warrant. So um, you, you find um, these types of uh, discrepancies in the law. So it just becomes a question of what is convenient to go to. Um, and so you find that um, most of the abuse of violation of rights usually happens with the um, use of the Cybercrime Act, for instance. You know, that's where 
um, powerful individuals and you know agencies of government go to to arrest journalists or to unlawfully insert communication on dissenting voices and human rights activists um, and all that. I think what is um, what what we can begin to do better, you know, um, as uh, human rights defenders and as, and as activists is in two ways. One is awareness and education um, to the citizens because they have to, they have to join in, um, in, in demanding their rights from government and in holding governments to account. And what usually happens, what, what we found that is happening is there's a lot of like lethargy. Um, people are not really concerned about these issues. Um, you know, uh, there's, there's um, not enough awareness, you know. Um, another area where um, it will be important to also engage is with um, strategic litigation in favor of data protection. Um, you know, especially in cases holding government to account in the event of unauthorized use of data or unlawful inception of communication. I think that's another area where there can be a lot of focus and stakeholders can also um, give a lot of support. Um, it, we, ha we have uh, a, a data protection regulation that sits with the government agency in Nigeria. And of course, you know, that begs the question of autonomy and independence, you know, and where, you know, complaint mechanisms are not clear, um, it becomes very difficult for, for, for people to be able to seek redress, um, you know, where, where, they are, where their rights are, are, are abused. So I think that these are some of the areas where, um, you know, where we can begin to look at and engage. And I'd like to say that, you know, these types of forums, these types of research are also very important for monitoring and documenting um, data rights trends and concerns in a way that um, um, stakeholders, including media, can, you know, um, can, can use this, this types of information for very targeted campaigns that can have influence on how, on how these laws are shaping up. And then finally, I'd like to talk about the issue of implementation that. So, you know, like I'd mentioned, um, there, are, there are certain provisions in certain aspects of law, but again, um, the implementation gaps are there, you know, in terms of um, it is not very clear, for instance, um, if, okay, so, so I give an example of when a law does not, um, is silent on like um, disclosing to a data subject when their, um, when their communication is being, is being interfered with, but then, you know, provides them to be able to, you know, um, seek redress if this happens. How, if they don't even know, if there's no notification to this data subject or to these persons that their rights are being violated, how then, you know, um, do they engage, you know, to know that this has happened in an unlawful way and this is a way that, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm hoping to seek redress. So um, I I've, I've mentioned a lot of things, but I think that those areas are challenges, but there are also opportunities to engage in terms of um, looking at how um, um, civil society can, can, can be more active, you know, um, in terms of um, imputing to how these policies and laws are, are being drafted and are developing, how we can organize campaigns, you know, um, um, in a way that, you know, um, highlights these gaps, you know, and also, again, you know, pursuing strategic litigation and making sure that um, the, the trends uh, are, are out there, are being archived, are being documented and are out there, you know, for, for all stakeholders to engage with, to learn from and to, and to advocate with. Thank you very much. Uh, just where you've left off, uh, you know, uh, civil society uh, coming in to do advocacy. Well, certain times, you know, uh, governments will raise the issue of civil society and, you know, development partners are not mindful of uh, the facts on the ground, you know, the unique uh, context in, uh, in, in, in the countries with um, terrorism, now with COVID-19. Uh, I'd like to go over to uh, Diop. How do we engage in a meaningful way so that the governments look at the work being done as supportive rather than 
you know, uh, putting them on the spot and, and not recognizing that there are challenges um, in our contexts. Dio, Abubaka. Uh, Aloïe. Uh, hello. You understand me? Hello. Yes, Dio, we can hear you. Oui, uh, bon, uh, je sais pas, uh, je pourrais m'exprimer en uh, français. I can you speak French. Unfortunately, not. Je sais pas encore. Il y a quelqu'un parmi vous qui comprend le français? Oui, peut-être je peux aider. Oui. Bon, vous pouvez dire au modérateur que mon anglais n'est pas tellement. I, do, I think you can speak in French, then you will try to get someone to translate for you. Oui. Qu'est-ce que Paul vient de dire? No, no, no. Il, il dit que tu, tu peux parler en français. Après, on va, on va essayer de traduire en anglais. Voilà. Est-ce que vous pouvez me résumer un peu la question qu'il vient de poser? Donc, Sinon, je, oui, je peux essayer de le demander. Uh, okay. Mr. Gabriel, can you if if you possible just to repeat the question please as african countries deal with you know new trends like terrorism mm -hmm. civil society and other partners come in and, you know we have reports like this we put the governments on the spot to uh, you know respect the right to privacy mm -hmm. how do we start to work with the government so that they don't look at, at civil society as only being critical, but uh, you know, supporting, they're actually supporting the government's uh, obligation to respect the privacy of their citizens. Okay, uh, uh, Ababaka, uh, il est en train de, de, de nous demander ce que nous voyons depuis quelques années, que le terrorisme progresse dans, en Afrique, et en même temps, on voit que la société civile s'engage, euh, pas justement pour critiquer, mais peut-être aussi pour s'engager à côté du gouvernement. Et comment, en tant que société civile, on peut s'engager contre le terrorisme, mais en respectant la question du droit et de, et de droit, mais en même temps euh, d'accès aux données des gens. Oui, merci euh, beaucoup. Euh... Uh, C'est vrai, uh, depuis quelques années, uh, le terrorisme avance uh, grandement en Afrique, surtout uh, en Afrique de l'Ouest, uh, au niveau du Sahel. Et uh, à ce niveau, il faut dire que c'est vrai, les gouvernements ont deux préoccupations. D'abord, uh, assurer la sécurité uh, des personnes et des biens, donc uh, par rapport aussi uh, aux données. Et aussi, il y a l'impératif du respect des droits de l'homme et surtout des droits numériques concernant la, surtout la liberté d'expression et la vie privée. Et dans ce contexte, la société civile est en train de faire des, des, des efforts pour contribuer à la lutte contre le terrorisme, mais aussi... Euh, en luttant pour le respect des droits numériques, surtout euh, en ce qui concerne la liberté d'expression, la vie privée et la protection des, des données personnelles. Alors, pour ce que nous savons à l'état actuel, les États n'arrivent pas encore à mettre en place des mécanismes qui permettent euh, de, de sécuriser euh, les données personnelles, mais aussi euh, de, de voir comment faire respecter euh, la liberté d'expression tout en luttant contre les fausses nouvelles, euh, la désinformation, etc. Et je pense que c'est cette problématique euh, à laquelle euh, se confrontent actuellement 
les États africains, notamment en Afrique de l'Ouest, où, où le terrorisme sévit. Et nous, en tant que société civile, ce que nous pouvons faire, c'est d'essayer de, d'amener de, les gouvernements qu'on mette en place euh, des mécanismes multipartites où euh, toutes les parties prenantes prendront part pour que ensemble nous puissions réfléchir sur euh, les impératifs de sécurité et de liberté. Et parce que le fond de la question, oui. c'est à ce niveau. Est-ce que je peux peut-être traduire <laughs> I'm so oui. sorry because... <laughs> Excusez-moi. So, sorry, I don't know, Paul and uh, Gabriel, can I? And it would be very difficult just to resume what he said. Uh, can I? Yes, please go right ahead. For okay. The benefit of, uh, okay, okay. He was trying to explain that uh, in his region, uh, today is very difficult when we talk about terrorism and data privacy issues. Mm -hmm. Uh, many governments uh, don't have capacity to engage with ad other actors to fight against uh, what's happening today, but it's very important to protect data privacy. And he suggests a civil society that the government must create uh, different platforms to discuss with uh, many actors, not only as government, but with other actors just to fight against these issues. He also uh, underlines that it's very important to protect uh, human rights uh, and have a global approach uh, about data privacy and other questions regarding to internet, but also fight against fake news that what we have seen in uh, many countries in Africa. I don't know if you want to continue, but yeah, I think that it's all. Uh, Abubakar, uh, oui. vous avez quelque chose? Oui, juste pour résumer, euh, donné, euh, au Sénégal, euh, nous, euh, il y a une semaine, le gouvernement a pris euh, une loi euh, pour lutter contre le terrorisme et qui a été votée en procédure d'urgence à l'Assemblée nationale sans que aucun citoyen ne soit ni consulté ni informé. Vous voyez, et ça, pose, ça a posé un réel problème euh, de discussion au plan national. En plus, il y a un projet de loi sur la régulation des, des, des réseaux sociaux pour lutter contre les fausses nouvelles et la désinformation, sans que aussi la société civile soit informée. Et nous avons même euh, euh, publié une déclaration conjointe de la société civile pour dénoncer cela. Voilà un résumé l'exemple du Sénégal. Ok, thank you. Uh, just to finish, I'm so sorry about this problem. I was trying to say that you gave an example in Senegal that last week the government adopted a new law uh, to fight against uh, cyber terrorism, but also to protect uh, social media issues. And, but the government didn't discuss uh, these uh, laws with civil society. And this is an example that the government must discuss uh, these issues with society, not only adopt laws without uh, public discussion or public consultation. Thank you. All right, thank you very much, Dick. Uh, uh, Dacio and uh, uh, Diop, thank you very much for those submissions. Uh, I'd like to go to uh, Huda. Huda, what role can uh, the regional bodies play? considering what has been shared with us from uh, the uh, report findings. Um, thank you very much. Uh, when you say regional bodies, are you referring to just the governmental groupings like the AU, SADC and COMESA, or are you also referring to um, the parallel structures that we see in civil society like um, organizations like CEPESA that also have a regional presence? Actually, uh, if you could just segment it into the two, uh, the, the, let's start with the, you know, like the ones like the AU and then we'll come to uh, the others, the civil society and what have you, uh, but very briefly, please. Okay, no, no worries. Um, so yeah, it's, uh, it's a really good report that uh, captures the current state of play in Africa, but it's really up to country, to, to bodies like the AU to first of all, revisit the existing, um, instruments that are in place for example um, as was highlighted in the discussion 
the African Charter still does not talk specifically about issues of privacy, um, let alone issues of uh, how digital technologies have affected the enjoyment uh, of the right to privacy. And then there's also, besides updating those laws, there's also the need to actually open up the consultation to include um, private sector experts and people that actually understand how technologies work so that we have laws that are actually practical and enforceable, but at the same time promote um, the enjoyment of human rights. And for regional states or bodies, I guess the, the strategy at this point is to keep on lobbying um, regional bodies to better adopt their instruments, to better adopt their policies so that uh, people enjoy their right to, to privacy and other fundamental rights. Um, for example, one policy that's emerging when we're discussing, one policy area that's emerging when we're discussing privacy was relates to the processing of personal information in as far as political campaigning is concerned. Um, a lot of elections in Africa due to COVID and other issues are now taking place partially, the, the campaigning is taking place online. And we also need to safeguard people's personal information in those contexts as well. So we need all those um, modern scenarios that are currently not catered for to be catered for in the in the laws and amendments that we see going forward. Thank you. Well, thank you uh, very much. Just uh, trying to make sure here that uh, I haven't missed any of the panelists. And if I have uh, a same way or uh, Paul, uh, please help me uh, with that. Because I'd like uh, to just uh, come back to uh, Baker from Nita U. Beck, are you there? Yes, I am. All right. Uh, on, you know, harmonization. And, uh, is there a case for harmonization and uh, any monitoring compliance uh, mechanisms in the regions that uh, uh, could be, you know, that, that we could bank on? Well, um, thank you for that. What I can think of is more of a continental one the Malabu Convention, it's just going through the process as Uganda of uh, ratifying it to become law, going through the usual process, through Minister of Foreign Affairs uh, until it's brought to parliament. That's one I can think of now. We have one to do the supported um, uh, the development of the cyber laws and uh, mainly the Misuse Act in East Africa. Those are the ones that we can um, be able to to benchmark on, but at least uh, what we've been using or really benchmark on, uh, the GDPR at least to have those principles because it's the basis on which uh, the obligations of the data controllers, processors, um, uh, uh, cascaded from and even the rights and how to implement them. Uganda has largely done the same. I've read the report, it has highlighted even other countries in East Africa, but in creating, um, sort of a regional body, if that's what you intend to ask about in, in enforcing to do with data protection at the moment, none, apart from ratifying the Malabu Convention, which is still going through the processes. Thank you, Becca. Yes. We have, um, we have a panelist from Tunisia. I'm sorry, I don't have uh, your name on my document here. So um, uh, please pardon me. It's okay, Gabriel, well, me, yes, sir. Okay, uh, if you could please introduce yourself uh, for the benefit of uh, all of us. Sorry, I don't have your name on this end. Yeah, it's okay. Um, so hello everyone, my name is Sister Shrini. I am a researcher and 
um, I've been engaged in the digital rights community uh, in both Africa and the MENA region for the last uh, five years. Um, so yeah, um, maybe I would give an overview of, of the situation in Guinea. Yes, but also uh, focusing on the experience uh, in the Arab world. Yeah, true. So I think there are so many patterns. I believe there are so many patterns that are very, very similar from what is being seen in the Sub-Saharan Africa and whether it's the North Africa region or the um, overall uh, MENA region. Um, we talk about the same issues like the oversight mechanisms and the authorities that are supposedly independent, but usually whether by law or um, by practice, they end up being under the um, under some institution or governmental body. Um, so that's something that we see also in countries like uh, Tunisia, when we have an authority that is independent by law, but the problem is that they, they don't have the allocated resources to do their work when in relation with data protection. On the other side, for example, in Egypt, we have um, an authority that is directly under the uh, Ministry of Communication. So here we see that even though we do have data protection laws in most countries um, like Morocco, uh, Tunisia, Egypt, um, but the application is very, very shy to say, to say the least uh, because either the authorities are not independent or don't have resources, but also when the, their reclamations and their, um, I would say, cases are brought to the judicial uh, bodies, usually they end up um, not taking the much um, investigation, etc. So that's pretty much uh, one common problem we see. Um, another one is, as the other panelists have said, is usually um, the security problem is being used as a counter argument of anything related to the right to privacy and data protection, when actually it's not necessarily the case because um, when you respect the data, the accuse the people's uh, data protection rights and privacy rights, you end up having a solid case, not a case that is can easily be withdrawn because of the flaws and not, not respect of the privacy. Um, so that's a very also common point. And finally, uh, the awareness, of course, because the privacy and it's usually, the right to privacy is usually put in a box, not only related being only related to the security or um, those kinds of problems, but no, it's also touches to the children's rights, for example. It also touches to the everyday user. It also that when you get your SIM card, when you get your internet, etc. cetera. Um, but we continue to see those cases overlooked um, either by the non-serious uh, work on it, or by the um, judicial bodies, but also by the exemptions of certain institutions by law. Uh, and that's something that was highlighted actually in the Tunisian report where we see that report, uh, actually the law was put in place way early in 2004. And it's an impressive thing, but the problem is that law was put just in the time Tunisia was still under dictatorship and ended up being just in place before the World Summit, World Summit, um, uh, the World Summit for Information in 2005, and was more of, let's say, shining the regime rather than actually protecting people's rights. And we continue not being able to um, update it because of political tension in, in the country. Um, so and people would relate it as not a priority when actually whenever we have an election, it comes back to surface because um, people are getting presidential candidates, for example, there were a case in Tunisia back uh, four years ago, it was when presidential candidates gave uh, endorsements or fake endorsements use, using citizens' data without their acknowledgement or consent. And it surfaced back to the, on the media, everyone spoke about it, but few years after we still don't have any case that the court have tried or anything similar. 
Um, so yeah, it's not definitely it could be easier to see those, the, everything related to privacy as just uh, something as complaints, et cetera, but it actually has an impact on everyday's life. And that's a challenge that I think civil society can, can help educate the citizens on it, but also the parliamentarians, because it's very common a problem. When I, for example, worked a little bit with the parliament in Tunisia, it was very common that they don't actually understand uh, the details of the data protection law or uh, how it will impact other, um, other fields. And usually that not knowing those uh, those details could then end up just voting yes as everyone else or just by taking the source of information just from the government and not in a multi-stakeholder approach. All right. Thank you very much, Jos. And uh, participants, please uh, continue using the chat, uh, uh, the chat tab. There's so many questions in the chat room and for those responding, thank you very much. I'm actually going to come to the chat room and uh, ask some of the questions there, put them to some of our panelists. But before I do, uh, Sigi, in part of the recommendations were on, you know, litigation, litigation in public interest. Um, how can that be taken up? And, you know, there are already questions around some cases uh, in Uganda and so if you have, if you go to court in public interest uh, and the courts locally make a decision, is there a way in which those decisions can benefit uh, other countries, um, you know, in the region? Thank you for that question. Sorry, I was uh, trying to find my mute, my mute and unmute, unmute button. Um, yes, I think just in terms of um, uh, jurisprudence setting, that some of these uh, decisions that are coming out of national, you know, out of courts at the national level, courts at the regional level, um, help to set, you know, a case just in terms of um, uh, in terms of jurisprudence. Um, so the answer to that question is is yes. Um, I think the other question, the other comment that I wanted to note is, you know, where national courts do not deliver positive um, judgments or rulings, that there is a possibility, especially for countries that are part of um, regional blocks, for example, the East African community, for you to be able to escalate um, those cases either within the hierarchy of the um, of the national um, the national hierarchy and where that fails, then there's room to raise some of these questions, some of these um, um, challenges at the regional level. Uh, one of the cases that I want to flag out that uh, Privacy International um, legislated on that has uh, significant ramifications just in terms of cross-jurisdictional, um, in terms of its cross-jurisdictional implications is the Amabungani case in in uh, South Africa, which dealt with the issue of a uh, bulk interception. Um, this is not just a, a historic judgment, but it has cross jurisdiction implications um, that I think um, um, act as um, within, within um, national context should be looking at, um, should be looking to replicate. Um, and, you know, just relying on some of the, the, the arguments that were made by the parties um, in, in that particular case. And um, I, I believe, uh, Koda, maybe you can uh, share the, the link to, to the Amabungani case, which I thought was very um, uh, ground setting. So yes, the answer to that question is yes, there are, there are a lot of cases, um, a lot of public interest litigation cases that um, stakeholders should be keeping an eye out for, um, tracking and then attempting to replicate some of those, um, some of those findings. Um, within within specific national contexts, and where that fails, then raising some of these questions before regional mechanisms, regional courts. Um, yeah. All right. Uh, Kuda, as you share that, I'd like to put this question to you as well. Uh, this one is in relation to uh, data localization, and uh, you know the inclusion of requirements to store data locally with cross border transfers uh, to the to be authorized by the DPA. Is this good for Africa? and what informs this kind of uh, decision? Um, I think the, the pattern that we've seen whenever there's talk of data localization laws has really been uh, a conversation that starts around trying to, first of all, control or have some form of jurisdiction over 
multinational corporates such as Facebook, Google, and TikTok, for example. So how do African countries get authority over those um, usually American-based companies? So the one thing that we've seen, for example, in countries like Pakistan, is where a country then introduces a data localization law and they try to force that those companies have um, a country representative so that whenever there's a problem, whenever there's an issue, they try to then deal with that local country representative. I don't think that is an, in a, it's an effective model because then it ends up, um, for example, if you look at the situation with um, Tesla, and most recently with Apple, where they've had to change their privacy policies so that they are allowed to work in a place like China. That allows, um, for example, in this, in this instance, the Chinese government to override some of the privacy protections that a corporation uh, like Apple would ideally want to give to its clients so that that corporation then is able to do business in the country. So first of all, I think that um, I believe that there are localization principles, laws and policies essentially make it easier to infringe on customers' um, rights to privacy. And secondly, um, this is something that, again, needs to be a conversation at a regional level how do Africans or African governments come together and have the same power that we see, for example, in the EU? Um, think about the number of fines that the EU um, collective councils or bodies have been able to levy against um, service providers like Facebook, Google, and other companies whenever those companies um, do not um, stick to EU, uh, EU GDPR's guidelines. So sort of like that's the same uh, mechanism that we need to put in place as Africans so that there is a collective protection of the privacy rights of Africans using those services. What's, uh, what's standing in the way of that, uh, Kuda? I think it's uh, essentially very um, undermined DPAs. So like mm -hmm. you were saying in your first question where you're saying the DPAs have to authorize transfer of information. I think that is just um, one example of how most African DPAs lack true independence because they are most, in, in most instances, mm -hmm. they are underfunded. Um, the people that are appointed to DPA boards are usually aligned to the ruling party of the country or the president of the country. And therefore they lack that independence and that actual um, political will to act in the interests of uh, users in Africa. And instead just tour like uh, political party lines and try to push for um, positions based on geopolitical um, reasons. All right, thank you. Let me put this to a topic. So with the, you know, enacting of the law, setting up uh, some of these, uh, you know, the DPS, and then not funding them, in some cases, not giving the political, uh, you know, support uh, or political will uh, needed for them to carry their roles out. Uh, how, how can we have advocacy around, you know, strengthening these bodies, uh, both locally and outside of, uh, of, of, of individual countries? Um, thank you for that question. I think one thing that is, that would be very um, crucial is to start thinking about how, um, is to start thinking about how privacy um, applies to us as Africans or as individual countries um, and emphasizing or highlighting, you know, um, in our advocacy, the, the importance or the advantage that governments now have when it comes to um, taking seriously the rights of citizens in cyberspace because it is becoming a competitive advantage and this is 
a language that um, countries understand. Um, you know, it is good to speak about um, human rights online as, as a democratic element of any society, which is really important, but we do know that this is not a language that many of our governments understand yet. You know, um, many of these governments are, are still steeped in mini military and authoritarian thinking, you know, um, even when they are wearing a democratic gap, um, that's, that's how most of the thinking is. So, but they do understand the economic language. And I, I do think that that's an advantage for, for advocating and for um, engaging around why it is really important for um, right to privacy and data protection to be taken very seriously and for understanding that, you know, um, just having a semblance of the GDPR, which many of these countries are going towards, um, they are trying to comply, they, they, are, they are thinking in terms of economic advantage, free flow of trade and all of that, but they are not really um, thinking about how this, how, how to develop laws that actually um, will enable trust in the cyberspace and will enable citizens to maximally engage and then, you know, in turn driving economic development and growth for these countries. And I think that, you know, um, speaking these types, this this type of economic language, you know, that governments are leaning towards and us and, and saying to them that if you ask, if you it, it is becoming a competitive advantage to be serious about right to privacy and data protection. And there's no way to be to signal that seriousness, you know, to the world and to engender trust, you know, um, without um, ensuring that, you know, you have um, data protection commission, not many African countries, at least not enough African countries even have data, commission, data protection commissions to begin with of commissioners. You know, um, for instance, in Nigeria, we do not have, we do not have this. Um, and there's a bill, you know, it is not yet law that proposes um, um, the data protection commission. But again, like Kuda was saying, the commissioner will have to be appointed by the president and that, you know, and a lot of appendages that will really make independence and autonomy problematic, you know. So I, I do think that, you know, um, that's an area, you know, um, that, that is important to, to begin to speak to, you know, when, when, when having these types of conversation with government. All right, thank you. I'd like to go to a question from uh, Moses Owing, uh, which is around how we strengthen conversations involving private players and uh, being mindful of the fact that some of these private players uh, uh, are bigger than, their, their budgets are bigger than uh, some, some of our economies. Uh, I'd like to put that to, let me start with uh, Kuda on this. Um, sorry, please repeat the question, the budget of private players to do it. I beg your pardon? Uh, please repeat the question, if that's directed to me. All right, so the question is from uh, Moses. It's in relation to how we engage with private players. And I was just adding that uh, some of these private players have budgets that are even bigger than uh, some of uh, the economies in, in Africa. So. <laughs> okay. Is uh, you know very different. Um, yeah, so that's the first um, that's the first actual realization that we have that uh, at a country level, um, very few African countries actually make like um, attractive um, investment areas for these um, private stakeholders or private uh, service providers. So the first thing that I believe would make sense is for us to come together collectively. That is why I believe that we still need a continent-wide privacy law, for example. Um, the same way that the European countries came together under the EU to come up with the GDPR, we also need to see that at an African level. But then unfortunately, because of diverse interests, um, specifically among governments, we see governments pulling in different directions. So even when you have something like um, the AU's uh, data protection and cybersecurity um, instrument, 
very few countries are actually taking part or signing on to that or ratifying that. And that is our, our undoing, because if we keep pulling apart, then we won't have that collective muscle that is needed to actually have the power to influence how private players actually treat African users and actually treat um, personal information uh, belonging to Africans. Um, so yeah, I, I really would say, let's try to push for a collective approach. What that looks like, I don't know, um, but definitely when we start showing that um, African countries have the ability to affect their income, then they might take us seriously. But until then, then they'll continue doing what they, they want to do. Let me ask Becca if uh, he has an idea of what that would look like, considering that he works in uh, one of the government agencies, uh, at least the one for Uganda. Becca, that suggestion from Kuda. Okay, uh, thank you, Gabriel. We are very much aware of that. And um, what has actually already doing something about it. I'll give you an example of when um, uh, WhatsApp updated their policies, their privacy policies and terms and conditions. So there is an organization that brings together African data protection authorities. So a suggestion and a proposal was made rather than each country going independently. And as you correctly pointed out, some of the countries, their GDPs are when are too small when you compare them uh, to that of such as uh, Facebook or WhatsApp. So we got together as the different regulators, presented our position as the African bloc uh, to WhatsApp, and we've been actually had a representative listen to us. So these associations and uh, collaborative efforts actually yield fruit because they got back to us, engagements are still ongoing. That's one of the ways through which we'll be able to engage these uh, big tech companies or even any other big companies that are collecting data. And we want to bring them accountable to uh, how they use it in respect to the rights given by the citizens in the respective countries. Thank you. Um, I'd like to put a question to Diop, but... Uh, Let's see if we have somebody available to help with the translation. Uh, this is uh, Vanessa's question uh, on how governments and uh, relevant authorities deal with poor oversight in data collection and management, uh, you know, and how that can be uh, strengthened, or at least from uh, the context of Senegal, how is that being strengthened? Uh, Abu Bakar, uh, je ne sais pas s'il si est là, mais Gabriel demande uh, comment est-ce que... Abu Bakar, tu es avec nous? Is somebody hearing me, at least? Yes, yes, we can hear you. Uh, probably Abu Bakar is not available. Yeah, it's so just, I, yeah, I can put Vanessa's uh, question to CP instead. Okay. Siggy, sorry. <laughs> yeah, you really put out my name, but it's all right. Um, <laughs> so I think I one of the... <laughs> Apology accepted. Um, one of the, the recommendations that we, that, you know, are coming out of the, the CPESA report and um, in other reports that focus on surveillance and data protection is, and this is something that has been referenced in the in the chat, is the need for um, uh, budgetary allocations, which is often a, a core challenge. Um, so, you know, ensuring administrative, legislative, budgetary and practical measures are put in place to guarantee the independence of some of these um, oversight mechanisms. Um, also ensuring that some of these, um, you know, for example, data protection authorities are properly staffed with the proper with individuals who understand 
um, what data collection is, um, what um, proper management of data looks like. Um, um, yeah, so I think that that that's, that is my one recommendation on how governments and authorities can deal with with this challenge. Uh, one of the issues that we are noted in the Kenyan jurisdiction, especially um, revolving around COVID-19 data collection, um, is the fact that even if there are laws um, that either entities are not implementing and enforcing those laws, um, and also you know pointing to the issue of uh, the fact that. Um, some countries have actually not yet operationalized their data protection authorities, which is a huge challenge, um, um, a very, very huge challenge just in terms of ensuring that there's actual proper oversight. Um, but, you know, going back to the issue of, of independence, I think that independent authorities, independent institutions um, will be able to deal with this challenge of, uh, of, of poor oversight. Um, but also, you know, just capping and, and recognizing the ecosystem that we operate in, um, uh, going back to the point I had made about um, entities, um, controllers, processors, taking their responsibilities um, and their obligations, um, either under national law or under international law, and uh, you know, taking tangible steps to implement and to um, to, to to enforce um, um, those obligations. Yeah. All right. So, okay. uh, in relation to uh, uh, what Sigi just responded to, uh, then the government interests. Uh, how 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 can that be balanced? You know, as you make these. Um, uh, entities independent and you uh, stuff them with people that are you know independent minded and, uh, and competent then the governments will start to worry about their their interests then where is uh, the interest spoken and unspoken uh, how is that taken care of um, I'll I think that that uh, question is Will get answered as there, there's more collaborative decision making in these issues. So um, the only way to ensure that um, all the interests, legitimate interests of all parties are protected is to have collaboration and decision making that is across board. Um, you know, to the degree that um, this, these conversations, these consultations, these engagements are happening in a meaningful way um where this these laws and these policies and these decisions are not only happening um, amongst the defense intelligence cyber security community but the stakeholder um, group is widening to include not just civil society but even private sector actors i think that's the only way that um you know government can start to understand that technical vulnerabilities are also social vulnerabilities and there are different kind of impacts that um, you know, um, um, you know, when 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 human rights are not protected online, it's also it's also impactful for governments. You know, so um, I do think that that's the only way to have um, these types of legitimate interests protected all around. We have to have meaningful, more meaningful collaboration and decision making. You know, where where power dynamics are not skewed you know, all stakeholders are able to meaningfully contribute to the process. Okay. I have looked at the questions in the chat and uh, a good job has been done to responding to many of them. And that's why uh, I'm not raising some of those questions because I can see that uh, the chat has been very active and people have been responding to the questions raised there. However, if there's any question that uh, a panelist feels uh, a question in the chat that has not caught my attention, but that you feel needs to be responded to. Uh, if, if you could just raise your hand and I will come to you and uh, you respond to, uh, the, you will let us know what the particular question is and uh, you respond to it. But as we do that, I'd like to ask uh, Tope in relation to uh, whether, you know, whether the African Commission on Human and uh, People's Rights uh, can can do more, basing on the conversation we've had, and if they can do more, what more should they be doing? Tope, are you there? Well, if Tope isn't there, uh, Kuda, could you 
respond to that? Um, please repeat the question, Aguma. Your connection was going up and down. Sorry about that. The question is around uh, what more uh, the African Commission on Human and People's Rights uh, can be doing, taking into consideration, you know, what we've discussed uh, uh, for the whole of the, this conversation. Okay, um, so what needs to be done really is to really embrace a multi-stakeholder approach. Bodies such as the African Commission are in a good position to lead on making good or positive policies around these areas. But because they either lack the will, the will to do so, or they lack the resources to also do so, they are not moving as quickly as um, is required under the circumstances. Um, so the first thing that they need to do is to open up the commission to more engagement with private players, with um, subject ex experts, as well as with other experts from other regions, so that there's that comparative um, angle that also goes into developing Africa's policies, so that um, our policies respond to the pace at which technology is being adopted in Africa. Of, obviously, we cannot even have a situation where the, the lawmaking matches the pace at which technology is adopted. But at least if we have um, policies that are responsive to issues like uh, machine learning, issues like artificial intelligence processes, issues like um, automatic profiling of people, uh, people's personal information, then we at least stand a better chance at minimizing the harms that happen or that are likely to take place from the adoption of those technologies. So we, we really need to see legitimate um, um, coordination among government, private and uh, commercial players so that the lawmaking is reflective of all the interests of the people involved in the use and development of those technologies. And we currently are not seeing that when we look at um, laws and policies and instruments that are being passed out by country, by um, institutions such as the African Commission on Women and People's Rights. All right, thank you very much. Uh, Dunia is uh, informing us that Ethiopia recognized and established an independent commission under a new proclamation. And information in this regard and help replicate in other places. Special mandate of the SEHPR uh, to, uh, needs to conduct progress studies, country visits, and during uh, the GA give opportunity to CSOs. Um, well, we need to keep showing that uh, CSOs are not uh, against the governments um, in this regard. I'd like to come to each of the panelists for uh, your parting shot. Uh, since uh, at least from my screen, I don't see any hand that went up in regard to questions that have gone unanswered that the panelists would like to respond to. And so I'd like to begin uh, with uh, Tosa for uh, a parting shot. And if we could have it in about one minute for each of us. Tosa, over to you. Sorry, that Yosa, Yosa. Today the names are really uh, giving me a challenge. It's okay. Um, so just as very last thoughts, I think that as they say, the, the details are everything. And through, I think, whether through this report or um, what we see and are observed in different countries, um, everything is in the details. If you give a, a data protection, authority, the independence, but you don't give it the resources, it's going to be useless. Um, if you just deploy it without giving it the human, uh, the human resources as well through appointments, it's also been very limited um, work. So I think it's very important to strengthen the independent authorities 
to make sure that they are they have the resources to do their work. Very few example is that now with the COVID-19 pandemic, we saw the, the, the government and private sector going, through, going toward the uh, choice in apps, but if the authorities don't have the resources to deploy to actually audit and see how the, te the technical side, I would say, of those applications it's very we stay at the mercy of um of the private sector or the uh, the government and i'm saying that, that because whether in my country tunisia or in other countries we we in a way we give the we keep the belief or we keep our right to privacy to to the good intentions of the government i'm not saying that yet no we shouldn't support the government, but it's also our right to actually critic and push for people's rights and human rights to be respected. Um, so as civil society uh, actor, it, we shouldn't actually shy out of our role to criticize whenever we need to do so, but also to look to the, pro the problems before they're, they're being trendy or reported by media, because that's also our, our role. It's our role to investigate further, to see the topics that are not being raised and that are not maybe popular. Um, so yeah, I think those would be my closing thoughts is to make sure that we, we don't shy out of the, our critics, but also to make sure that we are also investigation, investigating new technologies, immersion deployments, and everything happening in the backstage. Thank you very much, Yosha. Uh, Sigi, over to you. Thank you very much, um, Iguma, and thank you to the panelists and to the hosts, uh, to Sipesa, um, uh, and to the participants, I guess, just for, for, for this very, very crucial and um, important conversation. My parting shot will be very short, and um, it will be building on the question around dealing with, uh, with oversight. Um, I think what we often forget, especially when we look at uh, governments and, and regulators and um, authorities who deal with uh, data collection management um, and essentially just data protection considerations um, in the ecosystem, is that oversight over operates within an ecosystem where um, that requires stakeholders and entities to all have a general um, understanding of what privacy is, of what data protection is, um, of the safeguards and the standards that are expected within the surveillance environment. Um, so if we don't have that core understanding, um, then it means that only a small section of the population will be coming out and pushing for stronger standards, stronger, um, stronger protections, um, greater oversight. Um, um, you know, you know, just in terms of um, the surveillance conversation. Um, so I think my parting shot is we need to focus and prioritize, even as we are talking about um, um, oversight, we need to focus on capacity building, on awareness raising, um, not just for um, uh, for government and, and authorities, um, but also for the general public. Um, and that mandate, especially for countries that have data protection authorities, naturally falls on to um, um, uh, the, the data protection authorities themselves. So that is my parting shot, recognizing that oversight operates within an ecosystem um, where um, all stakeholders must be raised and brought to a general um, understanding of these issues. Um, yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Becca? Thank you, Gabriel. And I would like to use the opportunity to also thank Cipesa for granting us this opportunity as NITA to be able to attend and share um, knowledge with you, but then also get, I get to learn from other players. My last, um, uh, my parting shots, basically it's about uh, one, us as government, we are definitely going to scale up our awareness and promotion of the law, but also as I encourage the participants and even the private sector, is to continue familiarizing yourself with the law and also the channels that will be providing for making complaints of anyone that you are aware of that is violating the law, but then also of also uh, the tools that can be used because it's beyond just uh, looking out for people who are violating, but even empowering the citizen because a lot can be used from the law, knowing to do the information, correcting it, and, and also the timelines within which that should be done. 
that. I thank you for listening to me. Have yourselves a, a good evening. I don't know that it's good morning elsewhere. Thank you, Baker. Um, let me make an attempt to reach out to Diop and uh, could someone just help us uh, translate us Diop to give his parting shot? Because I see uh, Diop is logged in. Yes. Hello? Yes, Diop, we can hear you. Oui, uh, merci beaucoup. Uh, Est-ce que le traducteur est là? Oui, Ababaka, vas-y. Voilà, et quelle est la question uh, que le modérateur, uh, vous pouvez me résumer sa question? Oh, oui, il demande uh, le, le dernier mot que vous auriez à dire pour, uh, ce, pour, ce, pour cette réunion. Ah d'accord, le dernier mot c'est uh, surtout uh, que um, nous renforcions le plaidoyer pour qu'il y ait, uh, pour que les gouvernements puissent uh, uh, avoir des démarches participatives et inclusives qui puissent uh, prendre en compte toutes les préoccupations des parties uh, prenantes uh, dans le domaine uh, des droits numériques, notamment de la vie privée et de la vie personnelle, et ce qui pourrait... Uh, faire avancer grandement euh, euh, les questions numériques euh, en Afrique. Et surtout ça, la collaboration qui devrait y avoir entre le gouvernement et la société civile, pour qu'on évite des, des rapports conflictuels entre gouvernement et société civile, pour trouver des solutions idoines pour euh, l'Afrique euh, dans le domaine des droits numériques. Merci. Okay, that we should uh, just uh, enforce advocacy in order to make sure that uh, governments take into take into account um, a multi stakeholder multi stakeholder um, in uh, multi stakeholder process in uh, making policies and laws and uh, and laws to uh, and laws for data protection and other and related related issues. And in order to make sure that there is no uh, competition between uh, between different different parties, different stakeholders involved in the in the issues in in Africa. Thank you very much, Simone, for translating for us. And uh, Diop, thank you very much. Merci beaucoup. Uh, and that's as far as my French goes. Uh, <laughs> let me go over to uh, Tope. Uh, Tope has had to sign out. I think that's oh, what okay. she said. Yes. All right. Then I'll I'll, I'll immediately go to uh, Kuda. Um, thanks, Iguma, for the moderation, and thanks to fellow um, panelists and participants. Um, but what I would like to say is that uh, it's an encouragement to people in the room. Um, privacy. Most of us eat, sleep, and breathe privacy or privacy-related topics. But let's try to demystify these conversations and bring more people that are not already on the lookout for privacy related conversations. And in that way, when we involve more people, more members of the public, then what we say as civil society actors actually carries more weight because um, one of the challenges that we've faced uh, with some of the organizations that I've worked with on these issues is that the government asks you or the government bodies ask you, who are you representing? And then when you then try to bring on people, those people either don't understand what the ask is all about or why we're all making such a big deal about privacy. But when there are people that actually echo the call that is being made by civil society, that makes it easier to put pressure on government to introduce um, pro-privacy laws and pro-privacy policies. So let's do all that we can. Um, even the reports that um, are produced like this, um, let's also try to make them as accessible as possible to people outside of this room. What um, everyday examples can we use to help people understand concepts of privacy concepts of data protection, concepts of encryption, how can we help people to understand those things? Because people do care about these topics, but they only start caring when they understand how, for example, encryption or the lack of encryption threatens the 
amount of money that's in their bank account. So if there's no encryption, encrypted communication between your device and your bank, and someone is able to commit um, online fraud or access your account without your authorization, then people stand up and sort of take notice and listen on how they can improve their security. So let's think about these examples so that we bring more people on board and have that support. Then we just lead the charge, but with people backing our call. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kuda. And uh, Arthur, uh, Oyako agrees with you and he says oftentimes we're speaking to ourselves uh, when we leave out those that are outside these circles. Uh, I'm bringing this to a close and I'm going to go back to uh, Sipesa, probably Paul, for closing remarks. But I'd like to thank you all our panelists for sharing your knowledge. Uh, thank you, uh, Victor, for uh, the presentation you made earlier. And a special mention for those that were active in the chat, includes, including uh, Dunia, uh, Christopher Kayonga, Vanessa, uh, and, and Moses, and the rest. Suzanne, I saw you responded. You asked a couple of things. You responded to a couple of things. Uh, thank you very much for being active there. Uh, Paul, over to you uh, to just uh, close us off, or whoever it is you'll invite from CPESA to do so. Uh, thanks a lot, Iguma, for your moderation. I wanted to speak in French, but they told me there is no translator, so let me speak to English. I dare uh, you, but yeah, English. <laughs> <laughs> well, if you want, I can translate if you want. <laughs> See, you've got to do something <laughs> Uh, won't leave me alone. Um, I want to thank all the panelists for the wonderful job you, you've done to dissect these things and for the experience you've shared. Uh, the participants, I really appreciate your taking off time to come and share with us what you know. As space, I really take pride in making these convenings because they help us to build, but also to learn and unlearn many of the things we're doing. And we believe in collaboration. That we work, that's where the reason we try to evolve as many people as possible because many things as most of you have noted cannot be done alone and we need to work together we need to collaborate and build on each other's strength and support each other in doing this kind of work litigation advocacy work um, legislation so it is important that when these researches are done or our friends do work we we, we, we support each other because that's the only way the people we are speaking to can listen to us as, as one voice, but if we stay divided, then it becomes easier for them to really dismiss all our arguments. So I want to thank all of you. Uh, we shall be releasing a, a, a summary of the report that Victor presented later today as we work on the bigger report. And as I mentioned earlier in my opening remarks, we are trying to do a portal, an online portal, where we shall be covering all the 55 countries on the continent, try and uh, show where the countries are in terms of legislation and, and practices around um, privacy rights, but also how the different laws are being used to enable us to do a lot of advocacy around that. Because if we know what's happening in the region and the countries, then it makes it easier for us to uh, develop our ad advocacy strategies around the right to privacy. Thank you very much and wish you a beautiful day and uh, night for those who are in the evening hours of your day. And uh, again, thank you to the moderator and the panelists, all of you, and thank you very much. Thank you very much. Good day to you all. Bye.